All right, so it is a great privilege and honor uh, to um, introduce uh, our speaker this evening, uh, Dr. Jason Reed. Uh, so Dr. Uh, Reed earned a PhD and an MA, so that's a Master's of Arts, uh, in philosophy from St. Louis University, and an MA in apologetics from Southern Evangelical Seminary, and a Bachelor's of Arts in philosophy from, from Iowa State University. From 2005 to 2011, he was Associate Professor of Philosophy at Southern Evangelical Seminary, and in May of 2011, he moved back to Iowa to be closer to family. And after years of study, Dr. Reed, and by God's grace, came into full communion with the Catholic Church in August of 2012. That's beautiful, of course, receiving Jesus in the real presence in the Eucharist. And he currently is Associate Professor of Philosophy at Divine Word College Seminary. Uh, he has delivered papers at the Society of Christian Philosophers, the Society of Medieval Logic and Metaphysics, and the American Catholic Philosophical Association, and the American Marathon Association, um, so quite impressive, uh, and contributions to categories, and what is beyond, and wisdom and wonder. So it is my honor and privilege to ask uh, Dr. Reed to come forward to give us our presentation this evening. Where it all went wrong. Ideas have consequences and historic mistakes in thinking that helped drive the culture away from Jesus Christ. So tonight, I'm sort of like the, the bad news speaker, if you will, <laughs> the bad news speaker. So I want to commend uh, St. Joseph Church. Other churches need to, and other parishes need to follow their lead in dealing with the challenges of the world to faith. And so you could actually rename this talk tonight, The Rise of Atheism. Atheism is on the rise. And tonight I'm going to be looking at particular causes of atheism, in particular, lots of different causes. But tonight we're going to be looking at a cause of interest to Christians. Because unfortunately, Christians have played a historical role in aiding the rise of atheism. Turn this so before I speak, before I study, before I think about anything, I always pray the prayer that St. Thomas Aquinas, My goodness. there we go, God has spoken, <laughs> must be Thomas. So St. Thomas Aquinas is the patron saint of, and doctor of the church, he is Dr. Communis, and he's my favorite uh, saint, and he is a giant in the history of philosophy. He is a giant thinker, so we have him on our side. But what's great about Thomas, before he ever wrote or preached, he did a, a prayer, anti-studium. This is a truncated version. So I'm going to pray this to get us ready to add for God's grace, and it's a beautiful prayer before we dive into thinking, because serious challenges require serious thinking. Right? And, the Lord, and this is right out of the Lord's mouth. He said, be wise as serpents. It's not an easy thing to be, right? What's the greatest commandment? Love your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and strength. But yet be innocent as doves, right? So God asks us to be serious thinkers, to do the work. So we're going to do that tonight. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. An ethical creator. You are called the true font of light and wisdom and the origin of all things. Pour forth a ray of your brightness into the darkened places of my mind. Disperse from my soul the twofold darkness into which I was born. Sin and ignorance. Grant me keenness of mind, capacity to remember, skill in learning, insight to interpret, and eloquence of my speech. May you guide the beginning of my study direct its progress, and bring it to completion through Christ our Lord. Amen. St. Thomas Aquinas, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. That's a good way to start, eh? Yeah. Very good. That's what we say in Iowa, is eh? That's <laughs> the way it is, I guess. So, 
to get at the challenge of atheism, we have to learn some logic, brief logic, and we have to learn logic beginning with the scripture. This is 2 Corinthians 10, 35, and in this context, Paul is talking about spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare. And there's a certain kind of spiritual warfare that's philosophical. Here's the Lord, here's Paul's words. Indeed, we live as human beings, but we do not wage war according to human standards. For the weapons of our warfare are not merely human, but they have divine power to destroy strongholds. So there's that strongholds. What kind of strongholds do we need to fight? Arguments. Arguments. We destroy arguments. And every proud obstacle raised up against what? The knowledge of God. There are arguments whose conclusions are obstacles to the knowledge of God. And we're called to do what with these arguments? Re kind of just shake their hand, get along, annihilate. Now, annihilate arguments, not people, right? Arguments, ideas. So we can what? We can take every thought captive to obey Christ. So we need to go after arguments. That's what we're gonna we're gonna go over the arguments tonight, and then the rest of this year, you'll be tearing down those arguments. So what are these arguments? Well, how spiritual warfare works with arguments, there's a logical principle. And I'll give you a, a personal example here in a moment. One of the aspects of spiritual warfare is philosophical. They are ideas that stand between people and God. How so? Well, it is a law of logic for any two contrary propositions. If one is true, the other has to be what? False. Must be, logically. So if our culture accepts certain propositions that are contrary, the faith logically must be rejected. And that's what's happening, where there are certain ideas that are embraced by Christians, not all Christians, but a significant number that have caused this uh, block between knowledge of God and these ideas. So here's my personal story of how this worked. So that as Father mentioned, I'm a convert to the church against my will. I wasn't crazy about being Catholic. I think Catholics are weird. When I was a non-Catholic, I thought all this culture, they have all these statues, and smells, I didn't quite understand a lot of it. And so, the irony of becoming Catholics, I didn't read any Catholic books. I didn't read Catholic authors. Jesus was my problem. And I was in my office one time at the seminary, and I'm thinking through some things, and I go talk to my assistant, and I said, so Catholics really believe you have to eat Jesus? He opened up his Bible and read John 6. Closed the book, and went back to greater. If we accept the truth of something, we have to reject its opposite. So here was, here was the argument that was set up against me and the Catholic Church, actually. The first premise was, Jesus is God, whatever Jesus teaches is true. We accept that, true premise. The second premise is one that's tricky. Jesus teaches that unless I eat his flesh and drink his blood, I do not have eternal life. I do not have life within me. So what follows? Logically, inevitably. <laughs> that it is true. Because whatever he teaches is true, so there it's true. And I stared at that. Now, that just, for years, that bothered me. Why? Because, and this is where the Catholic Church is hiding in plain sight. Whatever contradicts that, whatever is not uh, opposed to that, isn't telling the whole truth. So here was what I was thinking, right? If, if I accepted the truth of the real presence, I was going to have to be converted. I was going to have to change religions, in a sense. I was going to have to, I was going to, have to become a fish eater on Fridays during Lent. You know, it was coming. And actually, I don't mind that. That's actually a good reason to convert. If you got a good, you got a good fish trap. Amen. That's a Baptist thing. Amen. Right. Then. 
I must also believe that those branches of Christianity that do not believe in it are wrong on that point. So that's how arguments work. Right? They are, in a sense, philosophy is dramatic. Arguments are dramatic because it's a story, it's a journey, and they don't mess around and they change the way you think. Now, so what can happen to me be converted to becoming Catholic can help people deconvert, people leave, if you accept certain ideas. So, for example, if I believe there are miracles, no miracles, thank you, then what can I not reasonably believe in? Resurrection. Resurrection. And who teaches that? The Bible teaches that. Paul, in chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, if, God, if Jesus isn't raised, if there's no resurrection, should you be Christians? That's the law of logic, right? There is an incompatibility between denying the resurrection and trying to be Christian. Of course, then he says, of course he's been raised. And therefore, we have all the hope. Okay? If he's not raised, then having faith in him is pathetic and sad. That's, that's Paul's words. But he's not. Right? He's not dead. He has been raised. And therefore, the same logic applies. So tonight, we're going to look at the major philosophical ideas behind today's unbelief in God, Christ, and his church. We're going to do some philosophy. And so we're going to look at the agnosticism of Immanuel Kant. If anything get out of this, you've got to learn the agnosticism of Kant. It's easy, right? You can't know. <laughs> wah, wah. Make sure that gets on the tape. You know what happens? If you're doing promos, that's going to be on there, right? You can't know, right? You can't know. That's agnostic, right? Mm -hmm. Well, then that leads to something. That leads to a mistake between faith and reason. Kant is going to separate faith from reason. And that separation has led to the rise of atheism, especially amongst the, the youth. So let's look at some worldviews first. Well, first, before we get to what agnostic is, people think agnostics are, you know, like atheists. I, sadly, most Christians today are agnostics. I, I teach in law. I've taught high school, uh, Catholic high school, elementary. Um, I love teaching the kids. They always ask about angels. Always ask about angels. Um, community college seminaries, and every place I go, I always ask this question. When we get to the, these topics. If I came to you and said, I can prove God's existence, would you believe me? Would you agree with me? What do they all say? Yes. They say, no, you cannot prove God's existence. We believe it by faith. And I said, well, that's not the, that's not the Catholic position. It's just not. It's kind of shocking to a lot of Catholics. So, so the church, you can prove God's existence. Yes, you can give arguments and prove God's existence. That's what a theist is. A theist is someone who believes that there's a real distinction between a creator and the creature. Okay? And there are two aspects to theism, right? that God created all, hence the hand, right? God creates all, but he sustains all. And in our prayers, we had that quote from Paul, right? In, the, in him we live and move and have our being. Theism is very close to pantheism. Pantheism is, pantheism is the view that God and the world are identical. Identical. So when the pantheist hears that in God we live and move and have our being, they think unity is identity. Because we are one with God, we are God. That's pantheism. To the Christian, unity always is it never gets meta, you don't get metaphysically closer to God because you come one with God. You're, there's always a huge infinite gap between you and God, metaphysically speaking. Right? You can, you can get closer to God than you were before. But you're always at an infinite distance. That's why in heaven, that distance is um, cut, uh, reached by God. He gives you the beatific vision. That's what we long for. So theism, not only do we live and move, so he's sustaining, and he's originating. That's how close God is to you. So for the theist, God is closer to you than the atoms in your body. He's that close to you. He knows every single thing that's going on in your body and your soul. He knows what's happening to every electron in your soul. Isn't that amazing? That's theism. So it's the belief in a personal God. Notice God isn't a person. We're not saying God is a person. God is personal, meaning God knows. 
God has a will. God has desires. God answers prayer. But he's not a person. He's not an individual. He is the one. Okay? So he's the creator of the world. And monotheism, of course, is the belief that there's only one God. And in our context tonight, to be a theist is to believe that we use, uh, that there are these philosophies whoop, that take the existence of God to be a more rational position. That is, the reasonable preponderance of the evidence requires someone to believe in God. That's what a theist is. Okay? That's what a theist is. In contrast to that, is the atheist. The atheist is a positive statement that there is no God at all. There is no hand, right? The world is all there is, and the existence of the world is a brute fact. It just is. Where is it going? There's no destination. It just is. There is no explanation for why the world exists. And they deny the existence of God. Now, what's an agnostic? Well, sorry, I got to cover this first. So an atheist is the view that there's sufficient evidence to deny the existence of God. And this one's just on the rise. Okay, it's not just that people are not quite sure. You're, you're having YouTube channels with young atheists, and they're getting hundreds of thousands of views. And their arguments are there's evidence for the denial of God's existence. It's not the claim that you can disprove God. It's not that claim. That's kind of a primary position. Well, if, if you have to prove God, don't you have to be God to prove? No. There's just, when you look at the evidence, they draw that conclusion. There is no God. So rather, it's the view that denying the existence of God is similar to denying the existence of a Bigfoot. I've looked for Bigfoot. I can't find him. I looked for the Black Ness monster. Can't find him. And if you're, for those of you who are into physics, I've looked for the ether. And then Einstein got rid of the ether, right? There's just no evidence for this thing. So an atheist is like that. So what's an agnostic? Agnostic claims we can't answer this question. Is there a God or isn't there a God? I don't know. Now, that doesn't mean you don't believe, right? Too often times Christians say, because I can't prove or disprove it, but I'm going to believe anyway. So agnosticism is compatible with believing in God. Atheism is not. So atheism disagrees with both us and the theists. Not the atheists. I love atheists because they get riled up about God's existence. I mean, they, they want to debate it. Agnostics don't want to debate it. They don't think you can. Here's their view. There is no sufficient evidence for either believing or disbelieving. As we're going to see, this is going to create a two-tier way of truth. Right? There are truths that you believe but you can't disprove, and there are truths that you can believe, and they're going to be different. So he disagrees with both, uh, both of them because agnosticism denies the question of God's existence can be answered, and I should add that it's qualified by reason. By reason. Often atheism and agnosticism get confused. They get confused with each other. Many people call themselves atheists when they're really just anti-religion. Okay. These are philosophical views. The true agnostic can believe. They just don't think reason can answer the question. Right? To be an atheist is to claim that there is evidence for God's non-existence. To be an agnostic is to refuse to claim whether there is or is not a God. Does that make sense, those three? Okay. So we're going to look at Immanuel Kant, one of the greatest thinkers of all time. Interesting guy. He was five foot tall. Lived in Prussia. He never, he never traveled more than 10, I think, or 20 miles away from his home. Bachelor his whole life. Maybe that's why he's agnostic. Maybe that could be it. But he was so disciplined. Lays in a pietistic background. Just a very disciplined, strict life. That the, the legend is, or the, the tradition is, that the town maids would set their watches when Kant walked by. Oh, he's walking by, it must be five o'clock. So they'd set their, they'd set their clocks. A giant intellect, giant. Uh, pietistic background, so he was a, very much an admirer of faith, but pietism stressed the heart, stressed 
feeling, stressed the encounter with God more than the mind. And he was a great defender of Newton. Vis-a-vis, -vis, he's set to answer the, the skepticism of David Hume. And he's one of the leading agnostics in the history of philosophy. And a believer. He believed that God existed, I thought. So for Kant's theory, this, I show this in my philosophy classes. Kant is a transcendental idealist. Yet a critical idealist. So here's what Kant thinks. And I'm going to explain these terms to you. So imagine there's a world out there, the real world. You've heard this question before, right? If I'm not out there in the forest and the tree falls, does it make a sound? Okay. Kant's answer is going to be, I can't know. <laughs> I can't know. Um, if you've ever watched Jurassic Park, right? There's the chaos theory theorist, and he's, he, he criticizes the Jurassic Park experiment because... You can't, you can, one cannot analyze something without changing it. Okay, so he's, so the, they've got the, the scientists there, we're trying to look at the dinosaurs in their natural habitat. And with the chaos theory, says, once you step in to observe, what have you done? You've changed it. That's kind of like Kant. Okay, for Kant, when you observe something, when you look at something, when you try to understand it with your mind, what have you done to it? You've changed it, okay? You've changed it. How have you changed it? Well, this is going to try to explain that. So there's a noumenal world out there. That's his, that's his word for the real world independent of my mind. And in the noumenal world, that's where God exists. That's where the soul exists. Where I just think about what the Father's talking tonight about the soul. Well, Kant would say that's a noumenal reality. You, science can't touch it. You can't observe it. That's noumenal. Free will, values, that's a noumenal reality. In terms of what we can see, we see the phenomenal world. And for Kant, we have our categories of mind, and we have space and time. And when I observe an object, my understanding is making it so that I can grasp it. So that would be the world of the scientist. So the phenomenal world is a world that I exist inside my own mind. And the noumenal world is out there. So our minds impose on objects categories so that I can understand them. Now, what was, what was reality before I looked at it? I can't know. <laughs> I don't know what's out there. And so I can't make an inference. This is important. I can't argue from this one to that one. When, in, when I'm in classes and students say, oh, I don't see what the big deal is about that. So I can turn you, I can turn you into an atheist in like 10 seconds. Of course, students say, prove it. So do you, do you believe you have a soul? You guys believe you have a soul? Where is it? Where is it? Can you point to it? Can't point to it. Because what's a, is a soul? Is a soul? If I, can I put a soul on a scale and weigh it? No. Is it colored? No. No. It's invisible. It's invisible. So where is it? <laughs> well, it's, well, I know what a brain is, and they're like, "You got me. You got me, prop. You got me. I don't know. I, I don't know how to do this." Now, the quick answer is. Wherever you point to the body, that's where the soul is. Because the soul, the body's in the soul. But that's for philosophical anthropology. Right? I want to get anthropology in before seven, and I did it. <laughs> I, get, I want to get my big words in before seven, before you all fall asleep from the top. So. But you see that point, right? So, Because this, this is a phenomenal thing. I can't point right, to a soul. That's got to be another kind of reality. So science, you go to a scientific lab, you don't study you don't study the soul in biology. Where do you study the soul? Yeah. Is God everywhere? Yes. Point to him. <laughs> Can you do that? No. So what what does this even mean? Well, because you can't point because this world is a phenomenal world. This is a space-time world. So your belief in souls and God has to be something that you can't 
reason to. That's nominal, though. That's numeral. So the, the conclusion of Kant's two worlds, right? So you, I think you're kind of getting the, the sense of it, right? If I can point to it, right, that's something I can measure, right? If I can see it, but I can't see souls, how do I talk about souls? How do I talk about God? That kind of thing. Here's the, here's the payoff. Here's what Kant believed. Human reason is suspect when we use it beyond the empirical. So Kant would say, if you try to use the mind to talk about souls, your mind's going to just, it's going to fall, it's going to go into crisis. I don't know what you're talking about. My mind cannot grasp what you're saying. So you can't go beyond the empirical. Human reason is limited to what the empirical sciences tell us. And right there we're seeing that what Kant does is that he's got rid of the liberal arts right there, right? Right there. There is no transcendent. I've asked, I've taught high schools, and I've asked the art teacher, what are you teaching? Is it knowledge? She's been trained to think phenomenally. Well, art is skill and technique. So we're losing that, right? So art's whatever the empirical sciences tell us. Human, human reason cannot be used to tell us anything about God. We cannot use reason to talk about God. There can be no truth about God's existence or nature, and faith and reason are completely separate, not distinct, separate. The most important slide tonight, two worlds. Sorry, there's the phenomenal world, and there's the noumenal world. Why is it today, you ask young people, or most people, is, is good and right wrong objective or subjective? They're going to say subjective. This is, it comes from this. Okay, because you have the world of facts, appearance, the thing to me that I can measure when using science, the material world, the knowable world, that's objective, i.e., the lower story. Then there's the noumena, the world of value, the real, things in themselves, the world of theology, the world of God, the unknowable, the subjective, the upper story. And so for Kant, you cannot reason from the lower to the upper. The upper is belief. The upper is faith. So what happens to faith and reason after Kant? The phenomenal world becomes the world of reason. The noumenal world becomes the world of faith. And we're going to look at certain applications of this to theology. What's faith? Opinion. So again, I've asked high school students, college students, my seminarians, when I'm doing theology, am I giving you objective truth? Is it science? In the Catholic Church, theology is the queen of the sciences. It's an actual science. Like, what? Yeah, you see how, how things have digressed, right? It's the inner world. It's a private world. It's the emotional world. I mean, you see how... How are churches trying to get people into the pews? <clears throat> that kind of thing. Appealing to emotions, appealing to the subjective, right? Appealing to meaning, inner experience. We're not doing this anymore. But the Bible says you accept Christianity because of this side. Right? So it's just interesting, right, that this is happening, that these are completely separate, feeling subjective, this is religion is, and it's true for me. Christianity is true for me, Jesus is my savior. Now, here's where we start to see the incompatibility. This is one of the greatest verses in, in all of scripture for the life of the mind. In, in Wisdom, ch chapter 13, he's in a sense agreeing with Kant. If you look for God amongst the things you can see, you remain a fool. God is not the largest thing around. God is not the biggest being that exists. 
God is not the greatest. He is the I am. He is the one. That's a different, that's a different thing, right? He is the one. So here's what the scripture says. For all people who were ignorant of God were foolish by nature. Now what makes him foolish? Well, he's going to tell us, right? They were unable to do something from the good things that are seen to, to know something. They can't move from what I can see to know what? The one who exists. That is, wisdom says there is a move that the mind makes that the fool is not making. Nor did they recognize something. They don't recognize the artist in it. While paying heed to his works. But they suppose that either fire or wind, whatever is the largest, most powerful thing, right? Or swift air, like a tornado, right? I mean, you ever, been, you ever heard there's like a tornado or something? And what do we want to do? We want to go see it. Why? Because it's terrifying and attractive, right? That's why God likens himself to a consuming fire. You want to get close, but yet you're scared to death, right? Aslan, the lion, right? You love him, and yet you're shaking. Same idea. Or the circle of stars, or turbulent water, floods, power, right? Majesty. So they think what? They think these luminaries of heaven, they think these things are the gods. Atheists, so the irony is that today's atheists, Catholics should be atheists in this sense. This is not God. So in a, in a twist of irony, I, I agree with atheists that I'm an atheist in that sense too. Right? That's a standard line that Catholic thinkers have said for a long time. I'm an atheist in that sense too. But there's more to it, right? If through delight in the beauty of these things, people assume them to be gods, let them know something. Let them know how much better than these is their Lord. So Doug was talking about, what, what's, this, what's this granite thing that you're talking about? El Capitan. Capitan? El Capitan. El Capitan. And you're saying when you see it, you... Can I say this out loud? Okay, he cries when he sees it. Why? It's just awesome. It's awesome. And who does it remind you of? That's the idea, right? When you see great things, you're thinking, who made this? What's, what's that person like? That's wisdom, right? What's that, what's that like? Let them know how much better than these is their Lord. For the author of beauty created them. And if people were amazed at their power in working, let them perceive something from them how much more powerful is the one who formed them. From, for from the greatness and beauty of created things comes a corresponding perception of the creator. Okay? Footnote, this is the philosophy of St. Thomas Aquinas. This is the doctrine of the church. This is what Thomism is. It's, making, it's natural theology. We can argue from the created world to God. And so in my philosophy classes, we critique Kant in that class. But we're not going to do that tonight because we've got to come to grips with the rise of atheists. But there is a, there is a positive side to the story. What's the problem? Wisdom and agnosticism are not compatible. Logic ends well, in the end. Can you see it? Right. So this is the interactive part of the program. Who can tell me what the incompatibility is? What's going on here? Why is the Book of Wisdom... Whoop. Sorry. This, this is counterintuitive. The up is bad. I know. Maybe it's not. Why isn't it going... You're going forward. Yeah. Pushing the buttons. Why are they incompatible? Because you can't know in agnosticism, but but you can know by looking at creation. If Kant is right, can the Bible be right? No. If the Bible is right, can Kant be right? Can you believe both of them? No, not rationally. You cannot believe them rationally. They are incompatible. So if, as agnosticism grows, logic is going to win. You cannot hold on to the contrary position. But there have been attempts to make this
compatible. We're going to look at the Darwin and Genesis, and then Jesus studies, Christ studies. So, Darwinian evolution, you hear this a lot, Darwin and evolution, and the Bible do not contradict. Why? Well, because evolution is what world? It's a scientific world, right? Evolution is true of the phenomenal world. There's no design. There's no need of a God hypothesis on the reason side. Organic life explained in completely natural ways. Right, Darwin was a thoroughgoing naturalist. There is no fall from grace. That is, there's no doctrine of sin in science. And there's no Imago Dei. There is no divine image. But no, no need to worry, because that's just what world. That's the world I point to, right? I can't point to my soul, right? I can't point to purpose, but I'm going to believe it. Because by faith, what do I know? The world was created. God creates according to kinds. Like, so Darwin's book is called The Origin of Species, right? 1859. Why is that title picked? Because a species was a kind of thing. And in the Bible, species were divine ideas, right? God created according to kinds. The species is prior to the individual. Species is prior to the members or the, the animals that belong to that species. So they're, they're created according to that pattern. Darwin is turning that on its head. There are no divine ideas. There was no pattern. So here's how I can test to see if you're a Darwinist or not. Are eyes, this is a question I ask a lot of students, and see what you have to say. You don't have to answer it out loud, but just think to yourself. Are eyes made for seeing? If you say yes, you're not Darwin. That's right. Why? Because the, the, because the seeing design is prior to the eye. They're meant to follow that pattern. So for Darwin, eyes, the power of sight, is an accidental feature that accumulated over millions of years by accident that gave the survival to, to those who had it, and that's it. They're not meant for seeing. So if, if the eyes aren't meant for seeing, the mind is not meant for knowing or thinking. That's okay. That's just the reason world. We can still have Genesis. We've got creation. We can, we can believe that God created according to kinds. We can believe that God causes life. We can believe that human beings have a purpose, that there is sin, and there is the amount of Two different disciplines, two different truths, and the beauty of this, supposedly, is that they'll never conflict. How do we make them compatible? By separating them. So the scientists can say whatever they want in their domain, and theology can say whatever they can in their domain, and there's no overlap. Do you think this is going to work? They're incompatible. So you, the only way to make them compatible is to give one up. Same thing is true when it comes to higher criticism of scripture. This is a whole new Jesus studies. There's a, there's a group of scholars called the Jesus Seminar. And the Jesus Seminar is an example of going after the, the natural, the, the, the phenomenal Jesus. You see that in movies like Jesus Christ Superstar, right? Having a super human Jesus, but not supernatural Jesus. So you've got the Jesus of reason. And who is he? He's a man. He has human weaknesses. Does the Bible say God has, Jesus has, did he learn through struggle? Yeah. He's limited. He makes mistakes. And even some say he makes errors. I had a, had a, a, a fellow colleague at one school say, oh yeah, Jesus like, made lots of mistakes because he's what? Well, he's, he's human. He has to fight bias. Jesus sometimes, as what they say, expressed the sexism of his time. He was a wise teacher like Socrates. That's totally okay. Because what Jesus is then? The historical Jesus. The phenomenal Jesus. Who is the Christ? Christ is noumenal. 
Christ is the is the faith. He is the word. He is one with the Father. He is divine. He is perfect. He is the head of the church. He dwells in our hearts. The phenomenal Jesus is in my heart. The, no, sorry, the noumenal Jesus is in my heart. The phenomenal one is in my head. And this is standard Jesus studies. The failed attempt to put those together has resulted in atheism. So the irony is that agnosticism, by trying to save faith, gave rise to atheism. Why? Because the upper story is no longer believable. There's, the upper story cannot, cannot be sustained. There's no need for it. There's no upper story because there's no lower story. There's just the story. Right? Logic demands that we reject the upper story because we all believe the lower story, quote unquote. And the lower story makes the upper story false. I just heard, it, I just heard um, again, another testimony today. Someone started studying um, evolution and Darwinism, these criticisms, and they don't believe in it. So here's what they, here's their idea is if there's only this world with these problems, these issues, these values, the proper stuff, response to the agnostic is to reject that two realm theory. Give up. Don't have the upper and lower, lower. Just go with the world we know. And there's no need to make faith and reason compatible. What we do is we embrace secular humanism. Because what does the word secular mean? This world. Right? Secular is phenomenal. So what happened after um, Darwin wrote his book and he had the higher criticism, all this incompatibility, here come the humanists. And the humanists made manifestos. 1933 is the first. John Dewey was a signer of it. Then in 1952, he had more of a universal humanism. They called it the Amsterdam Declaration. You can look these all up online. Okay. Then 1973, he had the Humanist Manifesto II. That secular declaration, humanists. And when I was a, when Doug, when Doug and I were students at seminary, this was the big one right here. Paul Kurtz was the leading of that. We study a lot of Paul Kurtz. But secular humanism was all the rage back then. Uh, 2002, the Amsterdam Declaration again. And then in 2003, they had a humanist, humanist Manifesto III. And they're everywhere. I bet you if you look online, there is, there's going to be a secular humanism um, society in Mon uh, Modesto. What are the basic concepts of the manifestos? This is where education goes in this direction. Traditional religions are inadequate or they're worse. Humans are responsible for our values determined through science, our intellects, experience in relationship to human needs. The meaning of life is to help all humans to realize their full potential. Sounds great, doesn't it? And now all humanists believe exactly the same things. They believe human beings evolved, and we have to have freedom of thought. Their, their, base, their main um, journal is called a free inquiry. And the free there means free from religious authority, free from revelation. They are optimistic about human minds, humans operating without revelation to solve problems. Well, how's that working, right? Yeah. <laughs> 1933, no creator. No creation and no God-given moral absolutes. Humanists, religious humanists regard the universe as self-existing and not created. It is a brute fact. There is no creation. Humanism believes that a man is part of nature and he has emerged as a result of a continuous process. And finally, there's no God-given moral absolutes. Modern science makes unacceptable any supernatural or cosmic guarantee of human values. We affirm that moral values derive their source from human experience. Those are the manifestos. And what's happening today is we have a secular culture. Secularism, right? What's the word secular? Well, it begins with the temporal order. Secular means here and now. If you watch Pepsi, the here and now generation, right? So for the secularist, now counts for 
now. The now only matters now. You watch uh, uh, Spaceballs, right? You're looking at now now, right? That's, that's secular, right? You're looking at now now. What happened to then? We missed it. When? Just now, right? The now now. So there is no life. There's no other life. And he says, that's what Father's talking about today. There isn't another one. This is all you've got. You better get it now. You may not get it, right? Today's marketing. If you don't get the new iPhone right here, right now, right? You've got to have it now. So as a philosophy, whoop, go back. Am I doing it right? Here we go. There we go. As a philosophy, secularism sees all matters of genuine human interest as reducible to factors related to the temporal world. So therefore, the only thing that matters is today. Secularism then is a group of doctrines and practices, and this is the result, right, that reject, they're incompatible with religion. There's no actual relationship with God and religion in any area of living, except perhaps maybe you can have your little meetings. The theoretical and practical exclusion of religious ideas and practices, including religiously taught morality, form of family life, education, government, business, recreation, social works, etc. So this has led to a complete misunderstanding of faith and reason. I hear, um, and I have to, when I hear even my own students talk about trying to make church more attractive, trying to get people in the door, trying to, you know, how do we win hearts and minds? So they're thinking about marketing strategies. Why? Well, because faith is now just a blind act of will. A decision to believe something for which is either independent of reason or is simply a choice to believe while ignoring the paltry lack of evidence for what it believes. Right there. So, so the idea here is I believe and nothing can prove me wrong. I believe and there's nothing that can falsify it. I believe no matter what. So it's personal, subjective, and theology is contradictory and in some sense irrational. Believing in miracles, right? believing in a burning bush that doesn't get consumed, believing that healings and resurrections and all those things, they're irrational, right? I think about uh, Miracle on 34th Street. You ever seen that movie? Right? How is faith defined? Faith is believing something when common sense tells you not to. And that's an old movie. Yeah, already wrong, already secular. So I'm about ready to wrap up here. Am I getting close to the end here? So then what can we know? Look at the chart. So biology, mathematics, history, all these things. What do these things look like? What do they look like? School curriculum. Uh, biz, uh, you, um, college majors. Where's God? Where's God? How much time do we spend on those disciplines? Where's literature? It's going away. How about theology? The Bible? God? The supernatural? The transcendent? Beauty? Goodness? Absolutes? Philosophy is having a hard time making a case now, too. Philosophy is dying because it's all ethics now. It's all about business ethics and environmental ethics, gender studies, all those things. That's what, if you go online, there's something called Jobs for Philosophers. We actually do want to work, apparently. <laughs> I told my kids that when I became a philosophy professor, I did that because if I'm laying on the couch and my eyes are closed, they can't tell if I'm working or napping. <laughs> And that's true. I could be actually thinking. Don't bother dad. What's he doing? We don't know what he's doing, but he may be working. Maybe working. So what are we doing here? I know what we'll do. We'll, we'll hire a religious ed teacher to have something on Wednesday nights. 
We'll have, we'll have a youth group and have retreats, which are fun, they're fine things. But can it compete? Now, historically speaking, I will take, do some footnotes here to kind of put these two things together. <clears throat> Classical Christian teaching, God is on the other side. And particularly, mathematics. What is mathematics the study of? Numbers. Where are they? Where are these numbers? They're not physical. Where are they? They are everywhere. Right? Why do people have a hard time with numbers? Because you can't see them. Right? I gotta do it all in my head, right? How many number twos are there? All of them? Yep, all of them. <laughs> Just, can you talk about the number two? Can you talk about the number two in the Jurassic era? Can you talk about the number two on Plato? Can you talk about Pluto? Can you talk about the number two in Jupiter? Can you talk about the number two in Iran? The number two in Iowa? The number two in California? <laughs> How many twos are there? It's the same for them all. And in classic Christian teaching, math was required before you did theology. You had to train your mind to think about something that it can't look at. Or you can't do theology. Isn't that interesting? I'm thinking about something that I can't see. How about triangles? Can I draw a triangle? No. Define triangle for me. Three-sided, enclosed polygon. The interior angles equal 180. Can I draw that? How thick is the line of a triangle? You can't draw a triangle line. And not only is it a triangle, the only triangles you can draw are a kind of triangle. Right? Equilateral triangle. Scalene. Uh, you didn't think you were going to have math class tonight, did you? <laughs> Isosceles. Yeah, but what do they all have in common? The three degrees. It's an idea. That's right. A form. Right? So does God, is there an idea of God? Ideas of God give us him, his form, but not his figure, not his shape. So mathematics actually is very difficult for God. So I was talking to the math teacher at the high school. I said, well, do you realize when you're teaching math, now this is some crazy Neoplatonists. But the idea is when you're studying math, you're entering God's mind. Because ultimately, according to Augustine, where do numbers exist? Where, where is the number two? In God's mind. And ideas exist where? In mind. So it has to, what kind of mind does it have to be? An immutable, eternal. You're actually thinking God's thoughts after him. In math. Isn't that cool? So math is a study of God. How about biology? Is God alive? Yeah. What's biology the study of? Life. We can abstract from physical life and talk about angelic life, immortal life, divine life. How about physics? Is God the study of, do we study God in physics? The, the atheists are, am I running out of, no, the atheists now, there's some atheists say that the study of physics is like studying the handprint of God, but we can't say that. The orderliness of the universe, all the factors that go in place and the beauty of it and the symmetry, you're studying God's ideas. Uh, let's see, economics. That's church. <laughs> Not guys. I'll be the church. Medicine. Medicine, all those sorts of things, right? They're all related. Okay. So, but for these thinkers, they are, and again, if you ask, ask uh, math teachers, what are you studying? 
Again, you can't write mathematical objects on the board. You can draw a circle on the board. You can't draw a mathematical point on the board. The objects of math cannot be put on a board. There's a really well-known Jesuit um, mathics, math teacher. He said, okay, class, we're going to study mathematical points, triangles, squares, circles, but none of that stuff. None of that stuff. Amazing, right? Again, it's training the mind to think about something that it can't see, but yet it can think about it. You got it. You can still think. So if we were in the car, me and my daughter and I coming back from church, and she said, I don't understand God, Dad, because I can't see him. I can't touch him. I don't understand God. This makes no sense to me. And so we're driving, and I'm thinking, so when you say the word of God, what are you talking about? Well, you know, well, you tell me. She started giving me all these ideas. And I said, of course you can talk about God. Because you have ideas about God. And you can actually think about something you can't see. Read, so the, this is the beauty of Catholic education. The proper object of the mind is the unseen. Flips this whole thing on its head, right? The proper object of the intellect is the unseen. Math, because even physics, physics studies things you can't see. Economic studies things you can't see. The ideal market, like what's the market? It's an idea. And that's all through here. The, 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 the irony of, of education is that in every single discipline, you're studying something that you can't see. You got it. But we're losing them. And so we're losing these things as well. Okay. So then why do we believe? What's the follow-up? Back to us. Now for the footnote, right? So secular, secularism is basically a theory of knowledge. How does one know things? Observation, scientific method, induction, experience, that kind of thing. And it is the dominant theory of knowledge in virtually all levels of learning. Is any wonder why so many are no longer believing? Here's a question to think, ponder. Are we teaching people to be atheists in our schools and parishes? Are we doing that? Now I get to go home. <laughs> Are we? 